Thank you, Aliska. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, so, like Aliska said, my name is Frans uh, van Buhl. I'm an evangelist at Exonic. Um, so, my job is to tell the world about the products and services that we offer, both the open source Exxon framework, as well as our commercial uh, offerings and services. Um, today will be about the GDPR module. Uh, I have a bit of a special relationship with that one, because uh, before I joined Exonic in the first part of my career, I was a security and compliance consultant uh, myself. Uh, so the GDPR module is kind of like my, my baby within Exxon, and I love talking about it, so thanks for joining. A um, little bit of context here and the agenda for today. So the Exxonic GDPR module version, version 1 was released last year in December, and it specifically addresses the topic of recon reconciling event sourcing, which is used by most Exxon framework users with uh, GDPR. Uh, so today we'll discuss what that challenge exactly is, where the problem, potential problem lies, uh, and we'll see how the module addresses this problem. Um, what we've also seen in practice is that this module is not always used in this uh, GDPR context. It's being used for wider cryptographic use cases, both related to erasure and to non-erasure use cases. We've been expanding that module in that direction. Uh, so currently we're at version 1.2, was released a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and because of this, we may be uh, rebranding this module uh, later on to reflect that it's not just about GDPR. But we'll start by considering the GDPR use case. So uh, let's start with events. Um, so event-driven architecture uh, is a very, uh, very big thing. It's recognized by one of the uh, major trends for 2018 by Gartner. Uh, and it's a software architecture that promotes using events. Uh, events being defined as descriptions of stuff that happened in the past. They have already taken place. That gives them a few very specific properties. Uh, events uh, don't change because they have already taken place. Uh, they cannot fail because they have already taken place. Of course, processing of an event can fail, but an event as such is immutable. It just describes a fact about the past. With Excel Framework, uh, many users use event sourcing. So event sourcing is a more specific type of event-driven architecture where you take this event-driven thinking to the persistence architecture, so to the way that you store and retrieve data from the program's working memory into something more permanent like a database. So how does that work? If, if you compare it with traditional persistence architectures, those would be characterized by the fact that you would store the current state of an object directly to the database. Uh, and if that state changes, then you would also change the record in the database. If that object gets deleted, you would delete the record in the database. In other words, you would have the familiar CRUD operations, create, read, update, delete. With event sourcing, you do something quite different. All state change in uh, an object would take place through events. Those events are being distributed, so other components may react to those events, but are also persisted to an event store. Uh, and to access the current state of an aggregate, you would replay those events again and then build up the current state again. Again, these events are Im immutable and undeletable. An example, uh, suppose you have an e-commerce system where you can order meals then a traditional persistence system may store the order like this, where you would have the order, the customer funds, and some, uh, some line items on the order, in this case, one pizza and one soda. With event sourcing, the same order, or the same order may look like this. Uh, it would be an event order created for customer funds. Uh, then you might have an event product added. Notice, notice how these events are always written in the past tense because they are about something that has happened. Um, then another product may be added, ice cream. Uh, and note that ice cream doesn't appear on the order in the traditional persistence uh, form. The reason for that is that this ice cream later gets removed in the life cycle of this order uh, before the order gets confirmed. And this immediately shows a key difference between uh, event sourcing and traditional persistence. With event sourcing, I keep a piece of information, the fact that ice cream has been this order at some point in time which is lost in the traditional persistence architecture. Uh, and if you're running uh, uh, sales or marketing for this particular company, you would probably be interested in the fact that I considered buying ice cream, but actually stopped short of doing this. Uh, what could a company do differently to sell more ice cream next time? So why do this? We have already seen one reason. Um, 
Generally speaking, there are, uh, this is driven by business reasons. So there are some technical benefits to doing event sourcing. Uh, it's convenient technically to have a single source of truth. It's, it really helps for debugging. You can replay new read models. But the key reasons are, are on the business level. It's about being able to look back into individual cases, what happened exactly. So it's auditing, it's compliance, transparency, uh, time travel, going back to a particular point in time and see what the world looked like then. Uh, and it's about looking at data at large by doing data mining, machine learning, analytics, all great technologies with great potential, but you can only apply them if you have data to feed into them. And event sourcing gives that data. So it's a good choice if you want to benefit from those technologies as well. Now, switch to GDPR. Um, GDPR is a very broad topic. There's many articles. For the purposes of the GDPR module and today's talks, we'll mainly focus on one particular article, Article 17, which is the right to erasure, uh, also known as the right to be forgotten. And what it essentially says is that a data subject, or a person about whom you would have stored personal data, um, has the right to demand uh, that you erase the data that you have about him. Uh, that's not an unconditional right. Obviously, it's not allowed to go to a bank and then get a big loan and then the next day go back to the bank and say, you should forget all you know about me, including that I owe you money. It doesn't work like that. But um, unless any of those particular reasons applied why you shouldn't delete that data, you must comply with the demand of the data subject to erase the data. Um, now, if we compare uh, GDPR and event sourcing, uh, contrast them. Um, generally speaking, uh, it's a really good match. Not so much because of Article 17, but there are many other parts of the GDPR that uh, call for transparency, to be able to show exactly what you have done, which decisions you have made. Um, and event sourcing helps you do that because it keeps all that information about what happens in the past. So generally speaking, it's a very good match and event sourcing will actually help you be compliant with GDPR. Uh, however, uh, the Article 17 thing that we've just shown is a big challenge. Uh, so because of Article 17, erasure of data is sometimes mandatory under GDPR. Um, events, on the other hand, uh, are immutable and undeletable, at least conceptually. Uh, so that's a bit of at odds. You cannot easily remove that personal data. So there is a challenge how to how to reconcile those two things. Uh, so let's have a look at some uh, some ideas to doing that. Um, so one one option that you would have is to delete events anyhow. Uh, after all, events are conceptually immutable and undeletable but technically they're just records in a database and there's no reason why you couldn't technically delete that data in principle. So you might, you might consider doing that. Um, similarly, you might consider modifying them and overriding certain field values. There are, there are a few challenges with that. It's, it's difficult and expensive to do that consistently. Um, if, uh, if you want to replay events with event sourcing and certain events are certainly missing, then the entire replay may not work anymore. Um, if you need to override just certain field values in an event, it's hard to do because those field values are serialized into a database as, as JSON or XML or something else. So you would have to go over the database, uh, deserialize, make an update, serialize again. You wouldn't necessarily know uh, which fields contain the personal data. So although it's possible in principle, you can of course change data. It's, it's not that easy to do it in practice. If you have a true append only event store instead of a regular uh, SQL database as an event store, uh, it becomes even more difficult because you may not have a regular update operation. Uh, and finally, if you one of the great things about event sourcing is that you have this golden audit record of what actually happened in your system. Now, if you start messing with that as a, as a routine operational procedure, uh, then the entire value and reliability and, and credibility of that event store uh, are diminished. So it's, it's a problematic idea for many reasons. Um, a second kind of solution to this uh, uh, GDPR right to erasure versus event store dilemma uh, that we see is to reinterpret the law. And we see that in two basic flavors. 
So one flavor is that people say, well, you know, the, the, the law only requires deletion from operational storage, so from the storage that will actually serve results uh, from queries. So in, in, if you have a CQRS event sourcing architecture, we're talking about the read model uh, side of things. And an event store or a backup or anything like that, uh, that's not an operational storage and that's excluded from the law. That's, that's an argument being brought forward. Uh, another argument being brought forward is that there, is, uh, there are a few exemptions from the right to erasure in the GDPR. One of that is data needed for legal claims. Uh, so if you say, well, I'm going to have event sourcing uh, exactly to support legal claims if they arise, uh, I can keep my event store exempt from the right to erasure. Now, if you look at whether those ideas would be effective, uh, the basic answer is no. As for the first idea, uh, there's simply nothing like that in the law. You can read the GDPR, it's, it's not an excessively long uh, piece of text and you will find that there's just nothing in there that supports this idea. This whole notion of an operational versus non-operational storage is not there. You need to erase data everywhere, uh, including backups. Um, as for the second thing, uh, no, again, doesn't work like that. So the exemption from legal claims uh, is, of course, for legal claims that you're actually having. If you're in, in an actual legal dispute with a certain data subject, uh, you don't need to delete the data of that data subject, but you cannot use that as a general way of, uh, uh, of circumventing the requirements from the GDPR. Uh, specifically, that violates the minimization principle. There's a general principle in privacy law already before the GDPR uh, that you should interpret the various uh, uh, clauses uh, conservatively in the sense that you should minimize the amount of data uh, that's being allowed to be kept uh, uh, according to the regulations rather than interpreting that as broadly as possible. Uh, a third potential solution that we've, uh, we've seen being discussed is to separate context. So you could have, uh, instead of having one big event sourcing context, you could have one um, bounded context for non-personal data, in which case you could apply event sourcing and you wouldn't have the problem uh, with uh, um, uh, the GDPR because GDPR wouldn't apply to non-personal data. And you would have a second context where you would store personal data, but you wouldn't use event sourcing in that case. So you could do regular deletion of data. And you wouldn't have the problem either. Now, of course, in the application's functionality, you would need to uh, have an inter integrated picture of that data, but you could do that using read models that would combine data from both sources. Uh, so potentially that, that could work and might solve it. Um, problems in this case, um, a lot of complexity to keep the mapping in place. Those read model projection logic is going to be really complex. Uh, depends a little bit on the nature of your application. If, if, if functionally uh, separating those two contexts is natural in your application, it might work. But if functionally those, uh, those contexts do not arise naturally, like in a CRM system, which would be all about personal data, uh, it's going to induce, introduce a lot of complexity because the separation in those contexts would be artificial. Uh, this is also a huge refactor in existing applications. So even though it might work in a green field, if you, if you have an application now which has integrated data for both sides, uh, it's hard to do. Um, and obviously, you throw away all event sourcing benefits for the personal data side uh, of your application, um, which may be more than you would uh, you would hope to lose. So it's not a not a really viable idea in most situations, in our opinion. Um, so what we've seen here is that uh, you need to do something to reconcile GDPR's right to erasure with uh, immutability and event sourcing, and most of the existing ideas have some major downsides and may not be generally applicable. So that's kind of like the area where we've written this GDPR module for. Uh, the main idea behind the GDPR module is cryptographic erasure. So the idea is to store data in an encrypted form and that gives you the option to delete the data by throwing away the key. So this is also known as, uh, as crypto erase, crypto shredding, uh, digital shredding occasionally. It's all the same same thing. We generally call it cryptographic erasure. Um, importantly, uh, this is not something that we have come up with. It's not a novel idea at all. It's, uh, it's a very common technology already 
uh, in the area of media sanitization. So talking about storage media at large. Uh, many uh, hard drives nowadays have the self-encryption functionality that would have this and they would accept a command to erase the entire disk at once. That happens very fast. And the way they, uh, they implement it is, to, is by having that disk always use encryption um, when, uh, when storing data. Uh, and being able to uh, to switch the uh, encryption key to a new key if you want to erase the disk, which would effectively erase the disk immediately. Uh, and, and because this is a common technology, it's also supported by storage security standards. There is a, a security standard by ISO uh, that describes this. Uh, there's also one by the American uh, NIST uh, that specifically supports uh, cryptographic erasure as a sanitization strategy. Uh, and uh, the NIST one is, is freely downloadable, so you can Google that as well. What we have wanted to do with the GDPR module is, is take this idea of cryptographic erasure, but then bring that to the application level for Java, so not just have it on this media level. Uh, and there were a couple of very specific design goals. First of all, to make it really easily usable, so no changes to business logic required easily to plug in into an existing application. We know how difficult it is, how much effort goes into the GDPR compliance efforts nowadays. Of course, being the uh, company behind Exxon Framework, we wanted to integrate this uh, very well with Exxon Framework. Uh, we also wanted to have this generally usable, so both with Exxon 3 and with Exxon 2. There are quite a few deployments of Exxon Framework still on Exxon 2, uh, but even use it without Exxon at all in the standalone application. Um, and it should be independent of serialization and event store choices. So whether you serialize to XML or JSON or something else, and whether you use MySQL or Postgres or Mongo or ExxonDB as your event store, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, the GDPR module should work in all these situations. Uh, once to give fine-grained control, so decide exactly what you want encrypted or erased in a given situation, and maybe just erase part of the data of a particular event and not, not everything. Uh, and finally, uh, this whole concept only works if you provide the highest possible long-term security. You cannot use an encryption algorithm that can be cracked uh, next year, uh, because then deleting the key is no longer equivalent to deleting the data itself. So these were our design goals. Looking at the API that we uh, created to, uh, to meet those goals, um, the GDPR module, first of all, has a class called Field Encryptor. So the Field Encryptor uh, takes an object uh, and then encrypts the object or decrypts uh, uh, the object. So it changes the object in place rather than creating an entirely new one. Uh, what the Field Encryptor exactly does depends on the annotations that are present on the object's fields. So this is mainly annotation driven. And that's one of the things that makes it easy to use. Uh, and easy to uh, implement in an existing application already. Field Encryptors itself uh, has the logic to interpret those annotations and decide what has to be done, uh, but it doesn't have any functionality for key management or for accessing the core cryptographic algorithms itself. All that functionality is in a separate interface called Crypto Engine. So that's where we have the the key logic, get or create key, get key, uh, and get cipher. So that cipher is a standard uh, Java class accessing uh, the uh, cipher algorithm. Uh, and secret key is, again, a standard Java cryptography class. Uh, and in Crypto Engine, we also have delete key. So that's where you delete the key to effectively delete data. Uh, the beauty about this architecture is that there are many different implementations of Crypto Engine possible. Uh, there's great uh, set of six different ones that we deliver, that we ship with the product itself. Uh, but it's an open interface, so you could also implement your own crypto engines if you need to do something different. Uh, the ones that we uh, deliver with the product are an in-memory crypto engine. That's obviously just for testing purposes, but it does make writing unit tests against this uh, a lot easier. You can go to a relational database using uh, either JPA or JDBC. Uh, we support hardware security modules through PKCS11 and the JKS uh, interface. Uh, and since uh, version 1.2, we have specific integration with HashiCorp Vault. And we'll uh, 
uh, come back on that later and discuss that in a lot more uh, detail because it has a number of really interesting applications. So the field encryptor needs a crypto engine to do its thing uh, and it, there are many different implementations that you could use for that. Uh, on the application side, uh, we have integrated the field encryptor with a field encrypting serializer. So you could use the field encryptor directly, but you have to uh, invoke those encrypt and decrypt objects uh, methods uh, yourself. The field encrypting serializer is an Exxon serializer that you can uh, configure instead of the standard serializer. Uh, and it would invoke the field encryptor automatically um, uh, before doing the regular serialization. Uh, so the entire process becomes transparent to the rest of your application. If you set it up like that, uh, then you fully meet this requirement of not having to change existing business logic because of implementing this. It will just work transparently. Of course, the field encrypting serializer still needs to know how to do regular serialization after encryption. So it takes, uh, it, it is both a, a serializer itself, but it also needs a delegate serializer uh, to execute the second step. Uh, this is also the mechanism that takes care of the Exxon integration. Um, uh, because of this, to make this integration really seamless, we ship the module in three different versions because those uh, serializer versions differ across Exxon versions. There's an Exxon 3 and Exxon 2 version uh, that, uh, um, uh, that extend this, their respective serializers. And then we have a version which we call the core version, which ships with, with its own implementation of this, uh, this serialization logic. So you can use it fully uh, without uh, having Exxon in your application. This is a screenshot of the code of what it looks like if you, uh, if you use this module. So in this case, we have a new customer registered event. Um, this event has a customer ID uh, present, a UUID. It has a customer name and some, some addresses. And you see some of the GDPR modules annotations here. So personal data, that's the core annotation that we use to indicate that a, a particular field or a particular collection of fields has uh, personal data, which should be encrypted in order for it to be deletable later on. And of course, the GDPR module needs to know which key to use when encrypting a certain field. The way we indicate that is by using the data subject ID annotation, which we've placed here on the customer ID field. So this tells the GDPR module that the customer ID field uh, contains the, the ID or the index of the key to be used. Doesn't mean, of course, that customer ID is the key itself or is being used as the key itself. It's just an index to the key. So we would find a record in the key store that maps the customer ID to a certain randomly generated key. Um, GDPR module also works very well with collections. In this case, we have an example with, uh, with a map. The map here is from address type, like home or work or, uh, or anything towards an actual address. Uh, so address itself may contain personal data fields like a street name or or uh, anything like that. Uh, so in this case, uh, by having the personal data annotation on this uh, collection, uh, we tell the GDPR module to recurse into that map structure and specifically look at the value sides of the entries uh, and, uh, and consider those for encryption as well. So you can protect complex object graphs in addition to just single fields. Um, Importantly, this is not just working with vanilla Java because most of the Exxon Framework users that have many events in their architecture would use something to avoid the verbosity of, uh, of using plain Java for everything. Uh, it works well with Kotlin data classes, it works perfectly well without any changes to, to project uh, Lombok annotated classes. Uh, and since version 1.1, uh, we've also made this compatible with Scala. So we have Scala specific versions of those annotations that start with lowercase letters, as is the Scala convention. Uh, it works with Scala case classes. Um, we support Scala collections, which do not derive from Java collections. So we had to, uh, to implement that uh, separately, uh, but all of that works now as well. So a few questions that we often get at this point, uh, and for that reason have already included here, including their answers, are, well, first of all, is this secure? because today's encryption may be hacked in the future and when computers become faster, uh, et cetera. So how can we guarantee that this works? Uh, is this allowed under GDPR? Uh, how about key management? Are keys secure themselves? Should they be? Uh, and finally, is this open source? Well, the answer to the last question is no, but let's, uh, let's take them all in some 
detail. So first of all, about long-term security, it's important to make a clear distinction between various cryptographic algorithms. They're not all the same. Generally, uh, the asymmetric algorithms, which use a public and a private key, tend to be quite sensitive towards evolution in computing power. So if you would choose uh, an RSA, that's an asymmetric algorithm, uh, and you want to have that secure in five years or in 10 years, uh, you should definitely consider what that means for key size. We, on the other hand, use a symmetric algorithm, more specifically AES, and it doesn't evolve in the same way. Uh, in AES, uh, uh, key length is not something that you can choose. There, is, there are three different key sizes that you can choose from, but it doesn't grow indefinitely, uh, as is in principle the case with uh, the asymmetric algorithms. Um, and they are expected to be secure in the long term. The way that you would... Uh, uh, try to crack an AES key is, is uh, by, by brute forcing it. It's the only method that we have right now. The best attack that is better than brute forcing, uh, the by-click attack, uh, is hardly effective. You would still end up with 254 of the bits of the, the 256 that would be there if you would just do brute forcing. So effectively, you're still back to brute forcing. And if you think about how large that key space is, uh, that's never going to work. You're never going to attack that with any amount of computing power in any amount of time. Um, we've also considered um, quantum attacks. Right now, quantum computers aren't really available yet, but they may be in 20 years or so. Um, what will happen if quantum computers uh, arrive is that the key size will effectively go in half uh, in, terms of the, in terms of security. Uh, for this reason, we recommend using it at a 256-bit key size. You can technically also do AES at 128 or 192 bits. If you take 128 bits, quantum computers arrive, you will effectively end up with 64 bits, which is uh, on the low side of being secure. Um, if we have 256 bits and you get quantum computing, you will still have 128 bits, and it's still totally impossible to hack that. So this is really very much long-term secure. And that's exactly the reason why this approach is also supported as a disk sanitization strategy in NIST and ISO standards. There is no way that you can break through this because of advances in computing power, even if you're talking about quantum computers. Uh, second question, is this allowed under GDPR? Some people uh, are afraid that you only can do real erasure or anything like that. Um, well, first of all, it's important to note that GDPR is explicitly technology neutral. That's in one of the recitals. Uh, and there is, uh, there's a very good reason behind that. Uh, legal texts uh, tend, to have, tend to be rather long-lived. They don't have this fast pace rate of change uh, that uh, computing technology has. So you don't want to bind any kind of uh, legal text to uh, specific technological implementations. So the GDPR hasn't done that either. It doesn't anywhere define erasure. Uh, it mentions erasure, but it doesn't define that in its in its glossary. So this definitely gives room to some different uh, technical implementations of the functionality. Um, it's also important to note there is not, no such thing as real erasure or anything like that. Any type of erasure that you would do on the computing system is ultimately some kind of procedure that you execute. Some being very strong, if you would physically destroy a disk that contains data and throw it away and shred it, probably the data is really, really gone. Uh, that's, of course, not what's being regularly done when deleting data according uh, to the right to erasure. What would happen most likely is that uh, a SQL delete statement would be executed on the database. Uh, such a statement doesn't delete any data from disk. It just marks the area as being available. So that's not an absolute erasure of that data anyhow. Uh, what we believe is that any kind of uh, erasure technology that you're using or erasure procedure that you're using to implement Article 17 uh, should be evaluated against strengths of procedures that are already regularly accepted. Uh, and cryptographic erasure, given what we've seen uh, on the nature of, on the, on the strength of this encryption by itself, uh, is in fact stronger uh, than what's regularly being done to implement erasure with a SQL delete. So there's absolutely no reason to ban this on the GDPR. We have had some discussions uh, about this with our customers and their, their auditors. And generally, once we explain this point, it's, it's totally accepted by GDP auditors as well. Um, 
Third question, so are keys uh, secured? Well, first of all, the module offers these various implementations of the crypto engine that have various ways to store keys. So the answer is it depends. In some cases they are, in some cases they are not. Generally speaking, from a risk analysis point of view, as long as we're talking about this crypto erasure use case, keys do not need protection beyond the baseline protection you apply to all data. So we're not saying that keys don't need protection, they do, just like all your data needs protection. Uh, and in other use cases and more confidentiality oriented use cases of the module, it may make sense to uh, to really uh, add an additional layer of protection to keys, but in the specific crypto erasure use case, you don't really need to do that. And to explain why, let's, uh, let's look at the situations without and with crypto erasure. So without crypto erasure, you would have some clear text event data records. Uh, and with crypto erasure, you would change that. You would have two separate things. You would have the encrypted record, and separate from that, you would have a key, which may be stored in the same database or in a different database, but that's what you would have. Now, if you would look at this from an attacker perspective or from a risk perspective, so what could happen that would threat uh, the confidentiality of this data? Uh, in the left-hand side, without crypto erasure, if uh, somehow this clear text data record uh, is compromised or an attacker obtains a copy of that uh, data prior to the deletion, um, then you have a breach. So then you have uh, then the confidentiality and the erasure is no longer warranted. With crypto erasure, uh, if this piece of data, if the encrypted data record in combination with the key gets compromised, then exactly the same thing is the case. So what you would see from this is that the, the, the level of protection that you would need for the key and for the data record are exactly the same. They, they behave exactly the same in terms of things that can go wrong to breach the confidentiality. You might even argue that if you store the encrypted event data records uh, and the key separately, so the, uh, the uh, uh, event data and the separate event store and the key in the key database, that inherently gives a higher level of security because you would need to have access to both as an attacker uh, before being able to access any data. Um, so with crypto erasure, you wouldn't really need to have an additional layer of protection on the keys. Uh, having said that, there are other use cases of the GDPR module where you would use it for more general protection of confidentiality. And that's a very different case. Then you would want to have an additional level of security and you don't get an additional level of security to your uh, data stored in the database if you would encrypt it with keys being stored in the same database, because then the risk profile stays the same and, and your goal would be in this scenario to uh, get a higher level of security. So then you need to protect the keys. The GDPR module offers two options for that. So one option has been around since version 1.0 and that's using a hardware security module through the PKCS 11 standard. That's extremely secure because the keys never leave that hardware security module. They will do all the encryption inside the module. So you cannot steal the keys. Uh, the downside of it is that these are expensive and not very scalable in terms of numbers of keys. Thousands of keys is already much, but maybe possible. Ten thousands or hundred thousands of keys definitely isn't going to work. And that's that's the kind of number that may be very, uh, very realistic if you're using this in a crypto erasure scenario or if you want to do encryption per person. Since 1.2, we have a new solution for that. That's the integration with HashiCorp Vault. So that's a very new thing in the module. We want to talk, that, talk about that in a bit more detail. Uh, so Vault is a product by HashiCorp and it's uh, advertised as a tool for managing secrets. Uh, it's a server, uh, which you can of course deploy as a cluster. From the perspective of a client system, there are two main things it implements. So uh, it of course needs to authenticate the client, can use tokens or LDAP or AWS. Uh, there are like 20 different things it, uh, it supports. But after authentication, it starts really delivering the service for the client, uh, and that's called a secrets engine. So the most basic secret engine that it has is key value storage, just does, uh, just a way of storing secrets under a certain key. Uh, and then there are many more advanced secret engines that would allow a client to transparently log into a certain database system, to cloud services, to many other things. Uh, so this is what it offers to clients. Um, uh, on the back end, if you look at how it implements that, it doesn't do so much itself. It delegates storage of keys to some back end system, 
console would be uh, kind of like the native option because that's also a product by HashiCorp, so it could store all the secrets in console. But equivalently, you can use a relational database or Cassandra or S3, or again, there are more than 20 different options. Uh, and importantly, it's, it protects those secrets, so it doesn't store those uh, those secret values uh, in clear text in the storage technology that you're using, but it seals those values, so it encrypts them. And there are many options that it supports there, again, uh, uh, out of the box in the, in the default uh, free version of Vault. It uses the Shamir secret sharing algorithm, so it makes sure that uh, if you get access to one piece of the data on, on one instance of your backend uh, servers, that's not enough yet to decrypt it. You would need to have multiple uh, secrets that you enter into Vault to, uh, to get access. But you can also use a hardware security module uh, to, uh, to protect the secrets, or you can use a key management uh, server from one of the major cloud vendors. So many options there. Interesting thing is that the if you combine a scalable storage technology like console or a relational database with a sealing technology, you get uh, the high security that you would otherwise get from a hardware security module. It's not as secure, but it's still much more secure than storing keys in clear text. Uh, but you wouldn't sacrifice so much of the scalability. Uh, you would still be as scalable as your backend storage system, which, uh, 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 which is uh, definitely capable of storing millions of keys. Um, Looking at the left-hand side, if you look at all the things that Vault has to offer, um, there are many potential ways in which we could exploit this in the GDPR module. So we needed to think about which would be the best way of doing it. Uh, things that we consider there, uh, we could use Vault for all cryptographic operations. It has this transit secret engine that would not just store keys, but also do the actual encryption, very much in the same way that a hardware security module would, would uh, do that for you. Um, we could use Vault for all the GDPR module uh, key storage. Um, so we would use the key value secret engine, but still do the actual encryption algorithms inside the GDPR module rather than in Vault. Uh, and we could use Vault in a much more lightweight way. So we could do a, a thing with master keys and uh, data keys and, and making uh, the GDPR module responsible for the individual keys while encrypting them with a master key in Vault. Um, the first thing is actually infeasible. Uh, for two reasons, it's not really uh, fast enough, uh, and the choice of cryptographic algorithms is a little bit too limited to, to make this work with the GDPR module. Uh, the third thing, it would be very easy to do, but provide very limited benefits of the fault, uh, fault features. Uh, so we've done the, the middle thing. We're using the key value secret storage, um, having all the GDPR keys protected as values, as secret values in Vault, but the encryption logic itself is being handled in the GDPR module. Uh, so what it looks like uh, technically is that there is just another implementation of the crypto engine interface called the Vault Crypto Engine, uh, and it uses a fast uh, HTTP client library to go to the Vault server and store and retrieve keys. So the last of the four questions, is the GDPR module open source? Um, it's not, so it's a commercial closed source uh, offering. And of course we have a, uh, a flexible pricing scheme that will work in many different scenarios. Uh, so you should contact us if you want to discuss that further. Uh, it is open in the sense that it is open and transparent about what it does. Uh, so there's an extensive manual. It fully describes the cryptographic scheme uh, that's implemented in the module. So you can share that with your security auditors, for instance, if they have any questions about what's going on. Also, the scheme is not patented, so you could implement that yourself or have others implement that or implement it in a different language. Uh, we feel that this is very impor important to be open about this, uh, both because you will need to be able to demonstrate your compliance with the law uh, to auditors, and you cannot do that if uh, the GDPR module would, would do something which is uh, intransparent, uh, and we don't want vendor lock-in. So it's possible that you uh, you should remain the owner of your own data at all times, rather than being locked into the GDPR module. Uh, just as an extract of that, to show you what it looks like, this is just one picture of the manual, which is very extensive. This is part of the algorithm being executed when uh, transforming a clear text byte array uh, to an encrypted byte array by the GDPR module. Um, 
what happens is that we create uh, uh, a random initialization vector uh, that's necessary to prevent certain uh, semantic security attacks. Um, then we do AES, uh, the core encryption algorithm, uh, using it in cipher blockchaining mode with PKSS uh, 5 uh, padding that leads to an encrypted byte array. Um, we create a digest and an encryption di encrypted digest of that same uh, data uh, that helps us to differentiate between uh, encrypted data and non-encrypted data when we decrypt and also to differentiate between encrypted data that's encrypted with the expected key versus encrypted data that's encrypted with a, a different key. Uh, and then uh, as, a, as a final component of what we store, and that's, that's optional, is to store a partial value of the clear text uh, version uh, that's being used, for instance, if you, if you would store uh, a date of birth of a person uh, and you want to be able to delete the month and the day while still keeping the year because the year by itself is so coarse grained that it doesn't qualify as personal data in most situations. You might want to keep that for all kinds of analytics later on even if you erase the personal data by itself. So this feature, this replacement value provider and partial value for storage would allow you to store that year in clear text form in the encrypted uh, data. Uh, all of the parts that we have obtained in this way would be uh, uh, stored in a single structure called encrypted field data, which we would then encode using Google's uh, protobuf uh, system into binary data. Uh, and that would be uh, replacing the clear text data in your field. Again, this is very uh, described in a lot of detail in the, in the manual. Um, so where does this module fit uh, in an overall strategy? Uh, it's part of a strategy to deal with mandatory erasure, which may be driven by GDPR, but may also be driven by other legal requirements. Um, it doesn't fit that, doesn't solve that problem altogether. Um, typically, it fits into a, into a flow that we see in the, in the diagram. So if you get this request for deletion and, and, you, and you actually need to execute it, you will always need to validate that first, of course. Uh, uh, many different things need to happen. You need to delete the data from the event store. That's the part that's normally hard to do and, and where the Exonic GDPR module offers a solution for uh, cryptographic erasure. You would also need to delete from read models if you're using full CQRS. Um, which you could do in theory with the GDPR module as well, but there's no reason why you should. It's easy to do that with regular delete operations. Uh, and then a number of other more administrative processes need to take place as well. You need to inform third parties. That's that's actually mandated by GDPR. And you need to inform the data subject as well uh, that you acknowledge that you have received this request and that you have executed it. Um, so it's part of this overall flow of things. Uh, the GDPR module also fits in cases where you want to do field level encryption in Java uh, to protect the confidentiality of the data, regardless of any uh, erasure use case. And that's actually a use case where you would typically use something like HashiCorp uh, Vault to make sure that your keys are definitely secure. Uh, so finally, we'll be taking some questions now. Um, you can also contact me personally uh, after the webinar using my email address or Twitter handle, or phone number. Uh, and we have a number of upcoming events as well that we wanted to point you to. Thanks for listening so far.